Hi, everybody. It's me again. Um, I just wanted to go through um, some of these models um, in case you're a little bit still confused. Um, yeah, I, you know, these are, um, I'm just going to get my pointer on here. So we'll just um, kind of go through these. And again, uh, just as a reminder, if you are still kind of struggling, especially if you are struggling with the activity that you're supposed to do um, for today, um, please, please, please take advantage of the office hours, either Thursday or Friday from one to two. So I'll just go ahead and get started. Okay. So what we're talking about today is the distribution size and interconnection of cities. And so there are a few models that help explain the distribution size and interconnections of cities. So we're going to talk about these three models here. Um, originally, this picture was up as a review. Um, Karachi, Pakistan has 16 million inhabitants. So you should be thinking about this as a mega or a meta city. If you're thinking mega, you are correct, because remember, meta is um, 20 million or more. All right. You might remember the gravity model. This is not the very this is not the first time that we've talked about this model. We talked about it in migration as well. And you're going to see me kind of um, refresh your memories on that a little bit. Um, so the gravity model. Um, as you can see, is the amount of interaction between two cities um, is proportional to the size of the city. Remember that this is based off of Newton's model. So um, in, in the migration unit, we were talking about how big cities were actually pull factors. Um, and so you can see here city number one, it's the biggest city um, on the screen right now. So you're going to have far, um, when we talk about in migration, you're going to have a higher number of people migrating to these large cities because there are more opportunities in the large cities. And um, when we talk about migration, we were talking about that in terms of jobs, but you can also think about this in terms of services as well. Um, and we're going to get to um, a conversation about services a little bit more tomorrow. But if you take a look um, at this, I'm just going to throw all these up here because I, I just want to kind of talk about this um, as, a, as I'm going through this. So if you take a look at this model too, there are a couple of different factors that illustrate um, how and why um, cities might have connection. The first thing is the bigger the cities are, as you can see right here, uh, the more interaction they tend to have. So that's why New York and LA have a lot of inter interaction, despite the fact that they're not very close here in the United States. Um, the other factor that um, illustrates how much cities interact is how close they are together. So this is why St. Charles, Bene Batavia, and Geneva have a, quite a bit of interaction with one another, but maybe not quite as much interaction as, say, um, um, like Chicago and, I don't know, St. Naperville. Um, so those are the two factors with the gravity model that you have to consider when you're talking about this in terms of cities. So the closer the cities are, the more they interact. The larger the cities are, the more they interact. And then this is uh, that fun math equation that I was going to have you guys do something with, but it's really not that important. So you can actually figure out how much interaction a city is going to have with another city by taking the population of city one. So let's say this population, the population of city two, say this population, multiplying those together and then dividing by the distance between the two cities squared. And when that number is higher, the, um, um, and correct me math people if I'm wrong, because I'm assuming that the number will be higher um, the larger the cities, then you're going to see more interaction. And then distance decay becomes important as well, because if cities are not very large or if they are further away from each other, so this is what this part is illustrating. So these are not very large cities. The further away these cities are from uh, each other, you're going to see some elements of distance decay. So the interaction between the cities are actually going to decrease. Um, so there's not a heck of a lot of interaction between cities like Geneva and, say, DeKalb. Okay. So there are two types of cities. These are the ones that you read, at, well, you should read the gravity model too, but these are the two that you are using for your activity. So the first, of course, is a primate city. And if you've done the reading and you're watching this later, you know that a primate city is not a city for monkeys, although that's a really cool number. Um, a primate city is actually a um, country that has a disproportionately large city in comparison to all of the other cities in that particular country. So for example, Buenos are IRAs, like no Spanish accent whatsoever, in Argentina is 10 times the size of the next largest city. So that is a giant difference. 
Um, Paris is another example of a country that has a primate city, um, is five times um, the size of the second largest city. So what this demonstrates is centrality. So um, in these kinds of cases where you have a country that has a primacy or exhibits primacy, that large city tends to have the political, economic, and social dominance of um, all of the happening things in that particular country. Um, it also is the city that offers the widest variety of services more than any other city. So you're going to find the most services available in those large cities. Uh, this is typical of unitary governments. Um, so bringing back some political and making some connections here to previous units. Um, if you have a country that has a primate city, and notice by the way, that we're not just talking about LDC, MDC here, because Paris is obviously in France, um, which is an MDC. And then you've got some semi-periphery countries over here. So this has nothing to do with LDC versus MDC, um, but it does have something to do with this idea of unitary versus federal. And that should make sense once I go over what rank size rule is. Um, a couple other examples. Um, Managua and Nicaragua holds 30% of the country's population and accounts for 40% of its economy. And that's huge for a single city, like almost 50% of the economy comes out of one city. Um, now, there are some pros and cons to this, um, to having a primate city. First, uh, if you are a business and you want to set up shop, chances are you're going to go to your primate city because, um, again, that's the largest market for goods and services. It's going to have the most amount of people who are willing to buy your goods and services. You're going to find your higher end products. I think I talked about this the other day, like um, when we were talking about um, like yesterday's lesson, um, you, you know, you're not going to find a Tesla dealer in, I don't know. St. Charles, maybe, but you will find it in Chicago. Um, another pro would be enhanced flow of information. So these are going to be your most connected cities. And remember, we're talking about interaction here. Like the gravity model said, these, these super large cities tend to have interaction, not just with cities that are in their own country, but also other world or global cities. Um, this is a good opportunity, of course, for global trade. So most of the global trade will actually flow through these cities. Now, there are some bad parts. First, um, in these kinds of countries, and take this with a grain of salt because of this bullet point especially refers to countries who are in semi-periphery and periphery, like it's not going to really impact France all that much because France is pretty well developed throughout. Um, but you're going to have an unequal distribution of wealth and or power. So you might have like one, like maybe Lagos would be an example of this in Nigeria. You've got this really awesome, well-developed, like modern city, but then everything else Um in the countryside is just not as developed. Um, sometimes, um, like Rio de Janeiro, which we'll talk about in a few days, uh, you might have some unsustainable urban growth, right? Because you're going to have, these are the cities that are going to draw the most people who are migrating from rural to urban areas in search of jobs. And if this migration happens too quickly, then what's going to happen is um, you're not going to be able to meet the needs of the people who are actually migrating to your city. And this could lead to slums or lack of infrastructure, education, all of those things out oh, there formation of slums and squatter settlements. Um, and then transportation issues prevent equal access to all regions. Oh, dang it. I had like a really good map to show you, but I forgot to put it in. So maybe I'll just like throw it in tomorrow or the next day in, in one of the, um, I don't know, additional things. But um, most of the time, if you have a primate city, um, if you can picture this, like just picture Paris, like all of the roads lead to Paris or all of the train systems lead to Paris. And again, even in, in an MDC, you're going to have some areas that are just not as connected to areas. And then this um, is the last thing really here. You're going to have brain drain from surrounding areas. And we talked about brain drain before, but that can happen on multiple scales. So you can have people leaving your country to go to other countries like a LDC to an MDC kind of situation. But you could also have like your best, most talented people in sort of the rural areas moving from the rural areas into the urban areas. And then again, you you, you might um, remember how that's problematic when you take all of the big brains and move them into a certain area. And then this little graphic is courtesy of Beilstein. Um, he likes his like silly little graphics. So boom. All right. Bye cons. And then, oh, I forgot. They're like dead. Anyway. Um, all right, so let's talk rank size rule. So rank size rule is essentially the nth 
largest city in a state will be one over n the size of the state's largest city. So um, that makes no sense. So let me give you an example. Or if you read it and you were like, what the heck is that? This is what this means. So the rank of a city will predict the size of the city. Okay. So for example, the fourth largest city will be one quarter the size of the largest city. So what this means is that you, when you have countries that follow rank size rule, there's almost like this weird math things that happen. So like the second largest city in a country will be um, half the size of the largest city. The third largest city in a country will be a third of the size of um, the largest city. So you're always taking um, the largest city and then dividing it by um, the rank of the rank in terms of population of the next city to get sort of the average population or the expected population. Um, and so you'll see when you are doing your homework assignment and you have to figure out the predicted, not the homework, the um, activity today, you'll see that like if you, you have to figure out the uh, predicted population, but you have to use the largest city. And then of course, just divide it by the next largest city, the next largest city, the next largest city. Now, this is more common with a federal system of government and it should make sense when you have these like it's not just one big city, right? So like you can imagine in Paris, it is the center of culture, the center of government, the center of economics. And so unitary state just sort of makes sense. But when you have a country like ours, for example, because we are, um, we follow rank size rule um, and you've got many large cities all over the country, um, it makes sense to, um, you know, shift power a little bit to those other cities. And so what you're seeing is here in a federal and not a federal in a rank size rural country that you have cities with a wide variety of services available to their population. I mean, think New York, think L.A., like think you've got Beverly Hills. So you Rodeo Drive, you've got like Mich like Michigan, Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And then in New York, I don't know, I think they have something there, but I don't know what it is. OK, so um, so when you are doing your activity, if you got stuck. Um, you have to determine the predictive population under rank size rule. So you have to do the map. So again, the second largest city will be the largest city divided by two. The third largest city will be the largest city divided by three, et cetera. And then you have to decide um, based on the graph. So the graphs are already, it's already graphed for you. So you just have to look at the predicted population versus the actual population. And if the lines match up, then it is a country that follows rank size rule. If the lines don't match up, then it's probably a country that follows primacy. And then your task is to do the map, uh, math, not the map, do the math. And then you're going to have to justify your answer um, using math as part of your justification. And I think that's it. So um, again, if you are confused or you want me to walk you through this just a little bit more, um, show up to office hours. I did it for the first time today with one of my other classes. It's actually kind of fun. We didn't work that much. We did like tours of each other's houses. So we can have fun and we can also work. So I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow um, face to face via the internet. Um, have a good day. Bye.